Hello, my name is Christian Mayens. This video talk is about the paper Efficient Simulation of Random States and Random Unitaries. And this is joint work with Gorian Alagic and Alexander Russell. Here is an overview over our results. In this work, we study the simulation of random quantum objects, like random quantum states and random unity operations. Um, we develop a theory of their stateful simulation. Uh, so this is a quantum analog of the um, well-known lazy sampling technique. Um, okay. Here's an overview over our results. In this work, we study um, the simulation of random quantum objects, like, uh, like random quantum states and random unitaries. And uh, we develop a, a theory of stateful simulation for these um, random objects. Um, this is a quantum analog of the well-known lazy sampling technique. For random quantum states, we can do this efficiently. And for random unitaries, we can at least do it in polynomial space. As an application of the state version, we develop a scheme for quantum money that is unconditionally secure and both unforgeable and untraceable. So that's uh, privacy preserving in some sense. Let me begin with an introduction. As most of you might know, uh, randomness is extremely useful, especially in cryptography, but also outside, for example, for Monte Carlo simulation and also more generally for randomized algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. An example of a random object is um, a random string. So that's basically the, the most basic random object, I guess. Um, and it's a very simple object. So um, for example, it can be exactly generated using n bits of randomness. Um, and because that's an, an exact realization of this random uh, primitive, the, it cannot be distinguished from itself, of course. Um, but we, we have also have approximate ways of generating a random string. And this is what, uh, what is called a pseudorandom generator. So here, we only want to generate something that looks like a random string to a polynomial time uh, distinguisher. And in this case, we can do this with a lower randomness cost and uh, therefore, thereby also. Here's an example of a random object, namely a random string. This may be the most basic random object that's interesting to look at um, it can be exactly generated using n bits of randomness, obviously. And because this is the exact object, it cannot be distinguished from, uh, from itself, you know. But the, we also have approximate ways of generating such a random string. So uh, more precisely, we have a primitive called a pseudorandom generator, which can use less than n bits of randomness to generate a string that is uh, at least indistinguishable from a random string to any polynomial time distinguisher. Here's an example that's maybe a little bit more interesting, uh, and that is the example of a random function. Let's say the function goes from the set of m bit strings to the set of n bit strings, uh, and such a random function uh, is picked uniformly at random from all. Uh, such functions, that means that each output is independently uniformly random uh, from the set of n bit strings. In this case, uh, the problem that we want to solve is the so called oracle simulation problem. So that means that we should be able to interact with uh, a distinguisher that expects oracle access to such a random function f in a way that they don't notice that they interact with us instead of with the random function. Again, we can, of course, do this exactly by sampling such a random function. Um, but that costs a prohibitive amount of, uh, of randomness unless the function has very short input length. And note that the randomness cost is um, a lower bound for the runtime and the memory cost as well. Now, there are several ways to restrict the set of um, distinguishers that we want to simulate such a function against. The first one is to limit the distinguisher to a constant number of queries, say t. In this case, we can use what's called a t-wise independent function. And we can uh, sample such a function in efficiently uh, using order t times n randomness. So again, there's, there's no restrictions, except that uh, we limit the number of queries of the adversary uh, to t. So in particular, um, there's no limit on the runtime. 
But now a complementary approach is uh, the, the case where we limit the distinguisher's runtime, but not its, its queries. So this is the setting where a pseudorandom function suffices. And uh, here we um, have a security parameter lambda, and such a pseudorandom function can now be sampled using a polynomial amount of randomness in the security param parameter lambda. And this is indistinguishable from um, a random function up to negligible error uh, to any dis distinguisher that has a runtime polynomial in that same security parameter lambda as well. Finally, there is a way of simulating um, such a random function against arbitrary adversaries um, efficiently, and this is called lazy sampling. And the only uh, thing that we have to give up now is the fact that our simulations used to be stateless. Um, now we have a stateful simulator that just samples each output as requested and keeps a list of the outputs that he has returned uh, before. It's an almost trivial algorithm, but it um, exactly simulates a random function um, in, a, in an efficient way uh, using you know, linear amount of, uh, of randomness in the output length and in the, in the um, number of queries. In this work, we want to look at random quantum objects. So in particular, random quantum states and random quantum operations. So let me introduce these objects. The quantum state is nothing else but a unit vector in a finite dimensional complex vector space. And because it's a unit vector, it comes from the unit sphere inside that vector space. If we're even more precise, then uh, actually we should restrict to the so-called projective space. But if you don't know that, uh, that projective space, then um, it's fine to just think of this vector coming from the sphere. Uh, a quantum operation is a unitary matrix um, on that same space. So here we are taking a matrix um, from the two to the n by two to the n matrices, complex matrices, that, that is unitary. So it doesn't change the inner product. And the set of unitary matrices has a very nice structure. It's, uh, it's a group, and actually it's more. It's a compact Lie group. So these two sets, um, the sphere, or more precisely the projective space, and uh, this uh, unitary group, they are both very nice mathematical objects, and they have a natural notion of a uniform distribution on them. And this uh, uniform distribution is called the Haar measure. Here's an example application of random quantum objects, and that's a so-called quantum money scheme. The basis of security for quantum money is the so-called no, no cloning principle, which says that quantum information cannot be copied. And one of the oldest ideas in quantum cryptography is to, uh, to make a money scheme, a digital money scheme out of that. One such quantum money scheme can be constructed using random quantum states, and that's the so-called Haar money scheme. This was uh, observed in a paper by Ji, Liu, and Song uh, in 2019. So here, the bank uh, starts by sampling a Haar random quantum state uh, with n qubits. Um, and now it can start uh, handing out copies to, to people as banknotes. So these all have unit value, same. So now uh, people can trade by basically uh, handing these quantum states to each other. And if anybody wants to check whether their um, banknote is valid, they have to send it back to the bank and uh, the bank can check whether it's the correct uh, state that they sampled. So this is nice because these banknotes are unforgeable. So you cannot make one your own. And you can also not copy them. You cannot take a lot of them uh, and make one more or something like that. You can prove that. And also it's untraceable in the sense that if somebody comes uh, to the bank and says, please verify this banknote, then um, the bank cannot infer anything about the history of this banknote um, from, from looking at it. The question is, of course, can the bank actually sample such a random state? This brings me to the next part of my talk, which is about simulating random quantum objects. Let us start with quantum states. Here, we want to solve the problem of simulating a high random quantum state of n qubits. We also look at this problem as an oracle simulation problem. So um, we think of simulating an oracle that has a trivial input, and every time it's, it is invoked, outputs a copy of a certain fixed but high random quantum state. 
In this case, uh, the prospect of simulating such a, an oracle exactly is even more grim than in the case of a ran random function. That's because we are looking at simulating a random object from an, a continuous space, which is a, a sphere, if you want. And um, so therefore, strictly speaking, it would require an infinite amount of randomness to, um, to exactly simulate such, a, such an object. Okay, fine. If we cannot simulate this exactly, let's try the next best thing, which is discretizing it. So we just pick a so-called epsilon net on the sphere, and um, we pick a random element of this epsilon net. So this uh, can be done, of course, but it still costs an exponential amount of randomness in the number of qubits. In addition, it actually implies a, a query limit on the distinguishers, and that is because every time we uh, hand out another copy of the, the quantum state that we have sampled, um, we incur another error um, of, of size epsilon. So therefore, if we have an epsilon net, then um, there is an order one over epsilon query limit on uh, the distinguisher. If we're already accepting that we need to limit ourselves to distinguishers that make no more than a constant number of queries, then um, we can do something smarter than epsilon nets. And that's what's called a state T design. This is a family of quantum states that has the property that if you sample a random one of them and hand T copies of it to a distinguisher, then they cannot distinguish it from a high random state. It turns out that there's an analog of pseudorandom functions in uh, the setting of high random quantum states as well. This is a fairly recent result from a paper by Ji Liu and Song from 2019 and uh, from follow-up work by Berkersky and Schmuli uh, from this year, where they develop a theory of pseudorandom quantum states. So a pseudorandom quantum state is a family of quantum states that has the property that if you sample a random one of them and hand a number of copies them, to a distinguisher that's uh, limited in runtime, polynomially in some security parameter lambda, then they cannot distinguish it from the same number of copies of a higher random state. So finally, what we do in this work is we um, develop an analog of this lazy sampling technique in the quantum setting. So we develop a stateful simulation algorithm that runs in polynomial time in both the number of qubits and the number of queries that a distinguisher makes. Um, and that can um, approximately, with a fixed error, um, simulate a high random state to such an unlimited distinguisher. So let me repeat this once more. So while uh, the runtime of our simulation algorithm scales in the number of queries of this distinguisher, um, there's no limit to this number. So a distinguisher can make an arbitrary number of queries. This just makes uh, the runtime of our stateful simulation algorithm also scale with this number of queries. This is fairly natural, right? Because um, at least the simulation algorithm has to answer each query. So um, at least it should scale um, linearly in the number of queries. Let's have a look at the case of random unitary matrices. So here we have a, a more natural oracle simulation uh, setting as well, uh, again. And that is because now we really have the setting where we, we're looking at a distinguisher that can make queries to a unitary operation. So it can input quantum states, then the unitary matrix is applied to them, and they receive the output back. Um, the picture for exact simulation and epsilon net simulation is very similar to the case of uh, random quantum states, except that um, the scaling in the case of an epsilon net is slightly worse uh, still because um, the set of unitary matrix has a larger dimension than a set of quantum states for a fixed number of qubits. Here we have again this situation that when we already accept that we limit ourselves to distinguishers that are limited to making a constant number of queries, then there's a smarter thing than uh, sampling from an epsilon net. And that's sampling from a so-called unitary T design. So this is the direct analog of a state D design for the unitary group. So here again, we have a family of unitary matrices 
uh, where sampling from it costs a polynomial amount of randomness in both the number of qubits and the parameter t, which is the constant number of queries that a distinguisher is allowed to make. And a random element from this family can now be queried t times and still appears indistinguishable from a high random unitary. Now the next setting is the pseudorandom setting, right? It turns out that the setting doesn't look so good, actually. And that's because um, pseudorandom unitaries were indeed introduced as a concept in the paper by Ji Lu and Song, but they don't have a provably secure construction, nor does every, anybody else have. So green is the color of hope. We hope, of course, to have a, such a construction at some point, but at this point, we don't have one. The last setting is the setting of lazy sampling again. So that's stateful simulation of this random object, in this case, the Ha random unitary. And this is where our work makes a contribution. So we develop the notion of stateful simulation of a Ha random unitary, and we construct such a stateful simulator that is unfortunately not probably efficient in the sense of uh, polynomial time. We have no idea of, uh, about the time complexity of this a simulation algorithm, but we can at least prove that it runs in polynomial space. Let us return to the application of harmony again. So we have seen that if we had a way to sample a high random state, then we could construct a money scheme that is fundamentally unforgeable and untraceable. So that's unconditionally. Now we ask the question of whether the bank can sample such a random state. So now we, we know the answer, it's no, right? They cannot, but they can simulate it. And now we have seen that there's two options here. First of all, one can use a pseudorandom quantum state. So this was already observed in the paper by Ji Liu and Songs. Using that, one obtains a, a quantum money scheme that is unforgeable and untraceable but only computationally so. So this is against polynomial time adversaries. With our new technique, now we can simulate such a high random state statefully, right? And thereby obtain an unconditionally secure untraceable quantum money scheme. Let me say a couple of words about the necessity of statefulness. Consider a stateless simulation scheme for a high random quantum state. Such a stateless simulation scheme can only work in the following way. It's defined in terms of a family of quantum states, and the simulation is initialized by picking a random element from this family and then outputting copies of this random element whenever queried. The problem is as follows. If you have two quantum states that are not the same, then it turns out that if I hand you either n copies of the first one or n copies of the second one, then you can distinguish these two cases with a probability that approaches one for n to infinity. A similar reasoning can also be applied when we're talking about two families of random quantum states that follow a different distribution. So this implies that statelessness implies a query limit, right? Because for any stateless simulation scheme, we know that if it's more efficient than a high random state, which requires infinite randomness, then it's not the same as a high random uh, quantum state. And therefore, it can be distinguished from it with probability approaching one for the number of copies going to infinity. And the, a similar argument can be made, of course, for the case of unitary matrices as well. In the last part of this talk, I would like to explain a bit the techniques that we use to obtain our results. For this, we need to dive a bit into uh, quantum theory. So quantum theory is inherently probabilistic. In particular, quantum measurement produces randomness. So therefore, there's really no need for an external source of randomness when performing simulation of uh, random quantum objects. Here's a fact that's even slightly weirder than, than the above one. Um, it turns out that a random quantum state looks exactly like half of a deterministic quantum state that has the so-called entanglement property. So let me try to paint a picture of this. Here you have uh, two quantum systems. You can imagine two quantum computers, and they are in a state that is de deterministic, but entangled. So if we now 
discard or forget about one half of the state, so one of the quantum computers, then the state of the other quantum computer is in fact um, the same as if we had prepared this quantum computer in a random quantum state. This means that for a stateful oracle simulation of um, a random quantum object, like a random state or a random unitary, we actually don't need randomness at all because the stateful simulation algorithm can just maintain an entangled state with the distinguisher, uh, making the distinguisher believe that they actually have um, a random object. Here's a version of this fact that we use for the case of higher random quantum states. M copies of a higher random quantum state in D dimensions, so D is equal to 2 to the n for n qubits, um, look exactly like a single higher random quantum state on the so-called symmetric subspace of the n-fold tensor product of the d-dimensional complex vector space. But this state in turn looks exactly like half of a maximally entangled state of two copies of this symmetric subspace. This is about as far as I wanted to go. Um, in terms of explaining the techniques that we use to prove our results. So here's an overview over the technical contributions. So first of all, we developed several new algorithmic tools that one could call uh, garbage-less preparation of quantum states. These are algorithms that use uh, a read-only register in some sense, but a quantum version of it, to transform a standard state, say the all-zero state, into a quantum state that is specified on the read-only register, uh, but without producing any additional garbage. So that's important because we can now initialize this read-only register in a superposition of different specifications and thereby prepare a superposition of different quantum states. We use these tools to devise concrete algorithms for the manipulation of um, states on the symmetric subspaces that I've talked about. So in particular, we have an algorithm that takes a, a, a maximally entangled state on two copies of the n-fold symmetric subspace and transforms it into um, a maximally entangled state of two copies of the n plus one-fold symmetric subspace. So this is very important because it's a, it's a key step in the algorithm in the stateful simulation that, that produces, in some sense, another copy of the higher random quantum state. Uh, finally, for the, for the stateful simulation of random unitaries that I didn't have time to talk about in detail, we use very different techniques. Um, here we mainly combine several nice ingredients, like for example, um, we, have, we think that this is the first application in the quantum setting of uh, exact unitary designs that were constructed by Kane in a nice 2015 paper. In addition, we describe an adaptive to non-adaptive reduction that uses post-selection. Uh, so in some sense, we, uh, instead of making adaptive queries to an oracle, we make non-adaptive queries uh, using a standard state, which is again a maximally entangled state, and later use a, a version of, of the teleportation protocol to teleport in our actual input. And uh, also we use the uniqueness property of um, the so-called Steinspring dilation of a quantum channel. This was my last slide. Uh, here's a summary and some open questions. We have developed a theory of stateful simulation of random quantum objects. For random quantum states, we can do an efficient stateful simulation. And for random unitaries, we can at least do uh, a stateful simulation that is uh, space efficient in the sense that it use, uses polynomial space in uh, the number of qubits and the number of queries. As an application, we construct uh, an unconditionally secure and untraceable quantum money scheme using the random state simulator. Open questions about this uh, approach include, can we simulate random unitaries efficiently actually? And I mean efficiently uh, in terms of polynomial time. Uh, and then one extremely interesting open question that is actually an open question from the paper by G, Liu and Song from 2019 is, you know, can we construct pseudo-random unitaries? This is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.